Um, you know, when you say the quantum leap that the physicists had, uh, from from an economist now, in if you re look at the writings of our forefathers, Adam Smith, and going back to Jerry ba Jeremy Bentham and stuff, they always started off with trying to understand the state of the individual. And the, ch the challenge was how do we improve well-being? So Jeremy Bentham, father of utilitarian economics, was basically on happiness. Uh, but somewhere along the line, we, we've forgotten the normative aspects. And so, and in a way, it, we took the easy route and looking on the positive, which is quantifiable, looking at production, efficiency, how to use natural resources in the best possible way. So we got really steeped in the means and we forgot what the ends were. And the ends was always human well-being. And we can make a very strong case of, if you look at human well-being, we have to preserve the environment. Uh, there's always this discussion about too anthropocentric, we have to look at the environment just for the sake, but that's a philosophical discussion which has been going on for now six, eight decades. And by the time we resolve it, we might not have an environment. So I take the pragmatic way. I said, if we show that human well-being, the constituents, what makes really people happy is a very pristine, not, I don't know, the term pristine is also loaded. A, an environment that they have reason to value. And many of us like green. We don't like a city which there's no trees. We like trees. We like open spaces. We like to see a f diversity of species and animals it, and, and you know psychologists have seen a uh, in drastic improvement in our mental state when we have these things making that argument itself we will win the case for the environment yeah. I, I think you have a point there and so it's a matter of seeing the pragmatics the reality and what the, uh, and what we, the ideal situation is and right now, so that's why the, the fact that economics, there's been a push to look at economics from a systems dynamics perspective. So you've got complex adaptive systems, systems which are adaptive, but understanding the complexity and looking at the feedbacks. Um, it's, it's, it's difficult, but I think we can make it simple enough. But there is a disconnect, and this is one of the things that is always kinds of worries me as well as also fascinates me is there's a disconnect between what we have like over the last few days been talking about and what happens in reality with policymakers. So uh, then there's a talk about the market and the state yesterday but the market and the state are people. It's not an entity by itself. It's made up of a collective group of individuals. So there's, and it's inter and I think it's important that we embrace the the fact that there are d differences among people, but even within people, and and psychology. And, and this has been an area that has been fascinating fascinating me over the last few years, and so I've been kind of studying it uh, like an autodidact. Is how does psychology, the state of your your own processes, have an impact on your values? your identities and therefore your behavior and action. And to sort of say like the economics uh, paradigm says you're irrational, they call it the homo economicus, the rational human being. But we are not rational. And in fact, the more majority of time we are completely irrational based on their notion of r rationality. So understanding that, embracing that, understanding that people are always in a state of dissonance Inconsistent, inconsistency in their value systems. I go through that on a daily basis. Um, so here I am talking about the environment growth, and on the other hand, so an example, perfect example was when I was stationed in Nairobi with the United Nations Environment Program, talking about climate change. I did my dissertation on climate change when climate change was not fashionable in those days. This was in the early 80s. And then I go to Nairobi, and then I, I face this thing. So Nairobi is, is a relatively dangerous area on the roads. I've got the safety of the family. So it's a matter of buying a gas guzzler of a cruiser or the climate change. And, you, you know, you're constantly in this dilemma. And I think everybody's have different types of this inconsistency in values. Mm -hmm. But rather than trying to find consonance with it, is to embrace it and then make those decisions. 
and understanding that there will be people with different values and different perspectives. How do we find that dialogue? I think the discipline will be able to, and it's already moving that, you know, you've got this group of uh, ecological economics, there's the, the new economic foundation and the new, uh, they're talking about new indicators. So it's, I think the question is growth in what? And, and if we say GDP, then we are on the wrong path. And, you know, the, 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 there was a really nice book written by uh, Stiglitz and Sen, which came out from a commission that was set up by Sarkozy, called Mismeasuring Our Lives. And I think we, you know, we manage what we measure, and if we are uh, measuring the wrong thing, then we are managing the wrong thing. And we are, we are using GDP as the only indicator for social progress. And the, the father of GDP warned at the time that he developed, do not use this to measure welfare. It is only to tell you how the resources are being used and whether they are being used in an efficient manner. But it is not about welfare. So somewhere there was a disconnect. And, and we keep saying that. And I think the economists, you know, you've got two, three Nobel laureates in economics coming and saying this is wrong. And yet the policymakers continue using GDP. Media also has a, a part of the blame. I turn on CNN, BBC, the, the usual, even, even coming to India over the last three months, uh, watch the local news. It's GDP, GDP, GDP. The minute there's a, even a 0.2% fall, they say the government's not doing properly. If one understands how they compute that, a 0.2% makes no sense because the degree of uncertainty is much larger than that. Uh, I, well, there's a positive correlation between the two. And, and when, when they say that if you take a particular action to mitigate climate change, whether it's CO2 or if, you know, even in the broader sense of the greenhouse gases, and they say it's going to have a 0.2% on GDP, it makes no sense because if you take the feedback effects, the cost of not inaction is much larger than that. So <coughs> that Stern report did something positive in a way. It brought a lot of knowledge that already was there within the economic community, but in a way it phrased it that the cost of inaction is going to be much greater than all the growth that we have. But again, GDP is the wrong measure to use because by creating CO2, uh, climate change, having all the things that come out from climate change, like if you have increased disasters, increased frequency of disaster, droughts and stuff, you know, you then ha you have to spend a lot in terms of regenerating the economy. That gives you a positive GDP. So that's the wrong measure. Now, if you have another measure which looks at the cost of crop damage, uh, sea level rises, as something that has an impact or brings down what you really feel is important. So in terms of, it could, it could be health. Uh, there's incidences, they say the incidences of zoonotic diseases are going to be on the increase. And we've already started seeing that. You know. And so <coughs> what will that have an impact on health? What will that have an impact on education? All the kids who are now, like say in Kashmir, they're not going to be, they are going to be out of school and for how long? This disrupts their whole educational system. Uh, this is a cost to society. We need to measure that. So the impact on climate change is just not on economic growth as measured by GDP. It's going to have an impact on societal well-being measured by a lot of other indicators like health, education, security. So that's the way we, we need to look at climate change. Well, that's the easy way out because technology, you can invest in technology that's measured because that GDP goes up. So it's an easy way of addressing it. Behavioral change is a lot more difficult. Uh, and uh, so how do you educate a whole new generation of thinking differently? So borrowing from some of the latest work on uh, ec behavioral economics. So you see, you, economics has this field on behavioral economics where they challenge the whole notion of the rationality model and stuff. So if you look at, uh, this is one of the challenges that I have put for the new institute that I'm running right now, 
is hu most individuals, they say, behave with a system one, system two thinking. System one is the reactive. It's based on the environment that you come from. This is based on a lot of the baggage that your family, environment, the way the society is. It's a systemic issue. System two is like the rational, where you take a lot more time. You're, you're doing your co social cause benefit, or for many of us, our own private network. Most of the time, we just do our thinking on system one. The challenge is, the system, or rather the system one now thinking is, the immediate is, what's it in for me? What's that going to have an impact on me or my immediate family? The rest of the society, well, that's an afterthought. I think the challenge is the first initial reaction of a system one thinking is, what is this going to have an impact on society? And then, oh my God, that's going to have an impact on me as well. We are, we are human beings, so it will eventually come. But the first system one is societal level. And I think we have lost that empathy for fellow human beings thinking as a collective, thinking as a collective unit working together. It's becoming like a zero-sum zero game rather than as a cooperative game. Well, the rank, ranking of countries, this is, this is an interesting thing. It seems to somehow rather excite people when they see themselves compared with others. Um, and I'm not sure what drives that factor, rather than sort of saying, am I doing well within myself? So for a country like India, is to sort of say, look, this is our resource base. This is a situation that we are. There was a lot of talk about context today. Is to look within your own context and say, are you happy with the advancements that you have made within yourself? Who cares about what's happening in China, whether you know they have done that? It's, it's about your people and stuff. But saying that now, we are living in a really interconnected world. So as you can, you know, climate change is a perfect example. We are suffering because of the fact that a lot of the developed countries were able to emit a lot of that CO2 in the initial stages of the industrialized process because there was a lot of free space up there. And, and so it's an interconnected world that we are. So that we can't sort of just look at within the national system, but in terms of Looking at how you are performing, it should be within yourself. I think ranking is actually apples and oranges comparisons. It makes I, I don't see any positive aspect of ranking countries. And I think there should be a measure which just comes and says, how are you doing within the, the kind of productive base that you have, the people that you have, the natural environment that you have. And we have to admit, we need to add, you know, the roads and bridges. It has made life a lot more comfortable. We need that. But as in, in, in your presentation this morning as well, is to find that fine balance, is to work within those limits and to identify what those limits are. And I think our energy should be focused on that rather than maximizing. Well, I think as the discipline, you know, the, the main focus has always been looking about exchange, looking about, well, I think the way that you're going to be able to address, uh, if you, I see it as the asset base. Now, in, and you can define that whether within energy bounds or others might be comfortable with capital and then they have social capital, uh, human capital, other things in that way. But to really make progress, it, it is not a, it's not a single disciplinary uh, approach. We need a multidisciplinary approach. And, it, and I think the scientific community around the world has, has kind of come to that terms. Even the natural scientists who always were a bit more elitist in a sense, look, we deal with the concrete stuff so we can have answers. The social sciences are always fuzzy and stuff. I think the way to address this would be to bring in a multidisciplinary group. So you, you've got people who understand the energy perspective, the thermodynamics, laws of thermodynamics, the entropies, ec economists coming. So to try to train an economist in that might not be the best way to do it. But to bring in a multidisciplinary team, and then you've got the other guys who, who don't even believe in that, so they come with their ideas. And to have that kind of an approach to think of how humanity moves forward. So far, it's been a very siloish approach. Well, you, you, you hit a very uh, critical point that is actually the mandate of the new institute that we have set up. 
And so we are kind of all right. So there are two options. One is you develop a new curriculum where you introduce this. I think our take is to actually embed these concepts within existing curriculums. Because our, our, immediate, uh, our first interaction with the teaching community is that there's already a curriculum overload. So either we kind of say these things are, are not important anymore and these are more important, but that kind of becomes into a value system. You know, if you look at economics, when I took economics, there was no philosophy. And I thought that was a major drawback. I would have liked to have had some courses where we were able to look at philosophical discussions because it's a very essential part of economics. But it's not that, it's gone. So I, the, the challenge would be to embed some of this, but not to make them uh, masters, experts in it, but to give them some idea that, hey, you've got to take into consideration these so that when they, when they get out there, they, when they are interacting in a multidisciplinary team, they can respect and understand the other teams. Now, that takes a long time in the present system that we have. I've had experiences with this. So if you bring in a multidisciplinary team, the first two meetings are all about feeling each other, all about saying mine is more dominant, more superior than yours, because we know what we're doing and what we're talking, yours is all further. So in a way, by embedding some of these concepts within some of the, so the, the concept of sustainability should be there. What does that mean? That's something that we need to tease and unpack peace, uh, social justice, it's also very important. It's hardly in any of our classes. It's all about competition. You can have good competition, but the, right now it's about getting the better of the next person. It's about getting as much as you can. So these are kind of things that need to be embedded in social justice. So in terms of the, I would not even go into, you know, because there's still the amount of uh, uh, discussions and work on the energy is to sort of say, look, boundaries, the notion of boundaries and limits have to be brought into the perspective. You cannot, it's, it's not like more is better. Psychologically, it's not. F physically, it's also not. So to talk about finite limits that you are talking about, that's important to put into perspective. Engineers will get that idea that, look, you can't solve everything with a techno fix. Um, economists will be knowing you can't fix everything with the changing in the demand and supply side. Uh, so in, in that way, we, we get those key principles embedded in all the disciplines, starting from a very, very early age, not at the university level, but at the primary school level. You hit the term beliefs, value systems. So I think the value systems in how we, I wouldn't say how we design it, because that has to be an organic process. It has to be from the people themselves, but dialogue. Having dialogue, the, the notion of understanding each other, um, these are important things that we do not have in our schooling system. Even the way we evaluate our students, it's always through exams. So the, the idea is to be in the top 10 or the top 40 and then well, sorry, but the other, but you know, it would be interesting to sort of say for the top 10 to go to the rest and say, thank you very much, because otherwise I would not have learned to be in there. So I've learned from you. And that can be changed in the next round, but it's a matter of appreciation. But right now it's, it's really a, it's a very Darwinian kind of a concept that we have to taken into our lives. It's a fit, survival of the fittest. And I think that's, uh, it's not a very compassionate world. Well, you know, the, what we can take an advantage of is, the, see, things like beyond GDP, things of uh, degrowth, are all coming from the, what you call the first world. And immediately it's looked upon with a lot of suspicion by the developing world because they say, ah, they have hit the wall. Now they want us to stop because they have already reached that. And, and I think that's a, that's a very myopic perspective. But the, what we can draw upon is, and which has been touted by a lot of the uh, leaders right now in this part of the world, is about values. The so-called cultural values, the beliefs, and the value systems of the developing world, which they say there's some, a lot of similarity. We have a lot of links with the nature. Is to use that talk to then modify what they're aspiring for. 
And so if you say Asian values, let me just talk about this part of the world, you know, then they have the Af African. So, the, so what does that Asian values mean? And if you unpack it, it's not about GDP growth, it's about symbiosis with nature and hu man, uh, humans. Man is not the right word to say these days. We've moved on. So it's about symbiosis, it's about harmonious, harmonious society. If, if, if you say you're talking about that, then what you're doing is there's a disconnect. And so it, we have to start that dialogue with them. But, but to sort of say it's not that you're giving up, it's about finding a better way for your people and for, for everybody else as well. I don't think we need to go through that particular strategy. You know, the challenge is, uh, and this is where we have decided to focus on, is the youth. Uh, many people see youth as uh, destructive, uh, anarchic, uh, rebellious, but I think we see youth as, a, as promise in the youth. And I think the youth are the only ones who are starting to question. And I think they haven't, you know, you, you, they haven't got to a point where the ideals have been compromised. They get into the situation, well, you know, this is the way it is. And so I've got to move that. Um, and in, if you look at most of the countries where there have been changes, it's been driven by the youth. Um, so just like what happened in Harvard, where the students in the economic class said, look, we, are, we don't want to be taught this. This doesn't work. It's caused a lot of problems. So either you come up with something new or we're dropping your class. And if you drop your class in that, so privatization works well in that way, the, the prof loses his salary because, it's, you know, they've taken capitalism to its best, all right? It's demand and supply, so it, it works against them. So I think that's, there's a move towards, in terms of embrace, embracing what the younger generation is looking for, and is to how to mobilize that, but in a, in a useful way. Because if, you, if that energy is tapped in a negative way, it becomes anarchic, just like what happened in, uh, in the U.S. recently with that shooting of that uh, young uh, Afro-American. Uh, the majority wanted peaceful, but you had some anarchic elements, and then it was used against them. So it's, you know, going back to, in a, in a way, a lot of the Gandhian principles are, are very relevant here. Uh, I'm still t coming into, uh, into the director of an institute called the Mahatma Gandhi Institute, and but as to how to see if his principles are as relevant in this contemporary society as that time, and I think it is. It's all about truth. I think he calls it satyagraha. It's about truth. And, um, and I think that's what the youth are looking for, truth. No more lies, no more uh, misconceptions. It's about truth. And it's their future, actually, if you're thinking about it. 25 years from now, that's their future. I, overall, I would say that we have improved, but we have at the same time, so s let me put it this way. You, you're saying not in the economic sense, all right, so not, not, to, only. not only. So material-wise, we have improved for the ma majority. And even for the ones at the lower, there is a little bit less violation of their rights, you know, like in the old you know, going back a hundred years ago. So if you look at Victorian times, people, the poor really were living in very miserable conditions. But because we have improved, the, the, the conscience of allowing a, la a relatively large group, because the numbers have grown. So in terms of percentage, hey, we have done well, but absolute numbers are still large. A billion people to be living in destitution is not acceptable especially when you have about a hundred mi million living in, in what you, I would say beyond your limits, way beyond those limits. And so how do we start thinking about sharing? Sharing, let's say, even from your own interests, because otherwise you're going to get into an anarchic sake of social tensions. Look at what's ha happening in the Middle East. W what's the point of having a lot of wealth and yet been living in a fortress where you have no security. You're not, so the, the very rich in the Middle East, you, they can't have security for their family. What's the point of the whole exercise? So I think that realization. Well, you know, the famous hockey stick uh, you know, diagrams that the, uh, one of our sister programs, uh, the International Geosphere Biosphere Program uh, uh, brought out where everything was kind of 
coming down, or rather with the increase. So, yes, I, I, I agree that uh, these things have to be uh, addressed. Water is going to be one of the, even more than oil. I would say fresh water is going to be the biggest resource that we have to address. And the only way we're going to be able to address that is to look beyond national boundaries and national security. We are living on one planet. That planet is becoming extremely small. So it requires a very drastic rethinking of the way we govern ourselves and the way we interact with each other. Um, I also see one of the positive aspects is the UN. It's the first time, I think, in human history where we have got together collectively to have an organization to oversee the welfare of, a, of the global group. Of course, we, we keep on saying about national sovereignty and stuff, but for the first time, we are collectively trying to address problems that we can't address as individual nation states. So there's, there's this whole notion of getting into nation states, but there's also this notion of having something which will help bring them together. So that's, <coughs> I think, an interesting uh, <coughs> phenomenon. I think also in terms of being able to voice your opinion is also, I think, the greatest uh, at this time. Yeah, you find places where people are not allowed to speak, but there are also things that have happened, the internet, the web. Uh, I was watching an advertisement in India, and some foreign university was there trying to sell their their university and their studies, and then immediately the boy at the back was going pop, 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 and said, hang on, that's not true. What you're saying is complete. So that kind of information is power. <coughs> We've never had that. So you're able to mobilize the masses. Uh, it's a matter of how to mobilize it in a, in a, in a, with a positive energy to motivate change. I see promise. I'm optimistic. Uh, even with a lot of, uh, there's a lot of, uh, we are not living in an ideal world. There will be people who will try to protect the vested interests. But I think uh, there is a movement going on, and I th I'm quite optimistic.